Abby, welcome back to 10% True. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you, Steve, for having me. I- this one, this one was a, a little bit of a, an ask. You were a bit reluctant to come back. I don't know if I if I wore you out last time round, but you, you've been on the channel a few times. So originally, you came and, and talked about the Red Eagles and, and Constant Peg and your involvement in that program, and you came back also then and talked about F sixteen. And today, we're winding back the clock, I guess, right to the beginning of your career, and talking about the F four. Uh, now, before I get started, I should just say to the audience that uh, the, the podcast is free. There's no advertising. I don't monetize it, so I don't make any money out of it. And the quid pro quo is that if you like this, you leave a comment, you like it, you subscribe to the channel. And most importantly of all, you share so that other people can listen to Gabby talk about the F4 and uh, benefit from the wisdom and the experience that he's going to bring to us today. That's my pitch done. So, uh, Gabby, how, how did you get introduced to the F4 when did you first start flying it? Yeah, but before we start, I've got these two disclaimers to make. First of all, as you said, I've done a couple of these with you, and I, I, I've looked back through one of them, and I was absolutely amazed at how many times I misspoke, said things like aileron when I meant flap or attributed something to one airplane when it applied to another. So I hope I won't do that too much this time. If I do, I hope your viewers will, will uh, take that into account a little bit. And the second thing is, uh, I got into the F-4 back in 72, so I hope that, you know, that's going back 50 years into my memory banks. I was in it for nine years, and this is uh, no preparation or anything. This is just what I remember from the planes that I flew at the time that I flew. So I went through uh, pilot training at Moody Air Force Base. Started in uh, around March of 71 and graduated March of 72. And I got an F-4 out of there to George. So went out to George in like May of 72. The the, uh, Vietnam War was going on. Uh, Started out in a a squadron called the 434th Tactical Fighter Squadron. And about halfway through that, they went to Vietnam. And so we went next door to a different squadron, the 4452nd. And that's where we finished. Uh, George had F-4Cs, Ds, and Es, hard wing Es. And their plan was for us to get 40 hours in a C, 40 hours in a D, 40 hours in an E. It was about a 120-hour program. That lasted two days. I flew TR-1 in the C model, went out for TR-2. That airplane broke and the spare was an E. We carried C, D, and E model checklists with us. Each one was about an inch thick. So when you had all three of them, they were about, you know, three inches thick sitting on your leg. So whatever airplane you got was what you got. It wasn't uncommon to go out and fly air to air and have uh, two E's and a D or go to the range and have two D's and E and a C model. You just took whatever came down after that initial attempt at, at, scheduling them off with C's, D's, and E's. Um, After George, I went to Bentwaters, got there the very end of 72. And for about the first year, we had F4 C's. And then we changed over to D models for the last two years. Our mission there, we were a multi-role squadron. Our primary mission was air-to-ground nuclear. Secondary was air-to-ground conventional. And our third mission was air-to-air. Uh, left there in uh, the first part of 76 and went to Clark in the Philippines, flying slatted ease with the 556 mod. And about a third of our planes had Tizio in them, which was the telescopic identification system, electro optical, the 10 power or so telescope that sat in the left wing route. And we were an air superiority unit. That's virtually all we did all day, every day. Uh, fairly short mission since they were air to air flying clean F 4s. I remember one six month period, I had 127 missions and 97 hours, average sortie duration of about 0.7 or so. Uh, left Clark in 77 and went to fighter weapon school at Nellis in the F 4. They obviously had slatted ease with the 556, but they didn't have Tizios. And of course, at Nellis, you do everything. You do air to air and you do air to ground. You do nuke, you do conventional. You do every delivery known to man. Um, There was one mission there where the student was in the back seat and you did 12 different deliveries with 12 different settings, each one totally different. 
And we had 12 three by five index cards, each one written out with what the WRCS offsets would be or the timers or this or that or something else. And you do one mission. And when you're on downwind, you just flip the card and you're setting up for the next mission. So when the IP turned uh, at the initial point, you were ready to go for that next one. It was uh, a workout. Uh, left weapon school in 78, went down to Homestead as a F, uh, F4 IP down there. And um, I think we had E models for about the first six months I was there. And then we transitioned to Ds. And of course, we did basic things air to air and air to ground with students coming through. So that's how I got into the F4, and that's basically my F4 career. Uh, want to talk a little bit about differences? Yeah. What, what you, you started on the C then on that first day. So TR1 is your first uh, call, your first flight on the B course. Presumably it was still mm -hmm. called the B course back then, so that's your yeah. conversion to the aeroplane. Um, yeah, describe what the differences were. Uh, first of all, an F4C and a D on the outside, very difficult to tell apart. On the inside, the F-4C was a very basic airplane, no real computers at all. Um, for the gun sight, for air to ground, you had a depressible uh, sight with mills that you'd have to put in something like 142 mils for a 30 degree dive bomb. And you added for wind or subtracted for tailwind, you know, maybe 0.6 mils per knot. And so you had a base leg. And to get the bomb on the target, you have to be at the exact right altitude, the exact right dive angle, the exact right airspeed. And as you might imagine, that never happened. So it was going into air analysis on you pickle high, you pickle low, how much go from there. Very, very difficult to hit bombs with with a manually depressible gun sight. Um, for strafe, first of all, the C and the D did not have a gun inside of them. So they had to load this gun pod down on the belly of it. And then you had to bore sight it. And they had this thousand inch bore sight board and a tool that they hung on it so that they could see around the nose gear well to try to bore sight these gun barrels with that thousand inch bore sight board sitting out there. And then they had a smaller tool that they put on it that they could project to the nose gear door. And they put a little X decal on the nose gear door so they could bore sight it more quickly if it got out without having to use a thousand inch board. So you'd go out to do strafe, and your first burst was as short a burst as you could get. All you, a sighter burst, all you wanted to do was see where the bullets were actually going to hit. Sometimes they were pretty close. Sometimes they were significantly off. So then you'd have to shoot, you know, put the pepper up and right and squeeze the trigger and hope that, you know, your analysis, air analysis from the bad bore sight worked. Again, not a very ideal situation. Uh, air to air with the with the gun trying to shoot a dart was guesswork. Once again, you had a, a manually depressed thing, maybe I don't know, 150 mils or something, and that would be good for a target that was at 15,000 feet, 475 knots true airspeed in a 3G turn. Well, you never had a target at that altitude, so. In order to try hit anything, maintenance had to load tracer in the gun, either one in five or one in seven tracer. And maintenance hated it because that put residue all over the bottom of the airplane, all over the gun, and they had to clean that stuff off. And even with the tracer, if you were shooting dart, it was hard to see if the bullets were arcing in front of the dart or behind the dart. So you'd get it out there lined up, and then you'd give the stick a little pulse and kind of try to spaghetti line snake the line of tracer through the dark to see if you could hit it um hitting it was um you know was a significant event you you got a pat on the back if you hit it it was hard to do that with the, with the c model uh nuclear for a c model all you had out in front of you was a five mile bomb strobe as the thing swept in the air to ground mode and when and you had a set of timers and you had two main deliveries timed level or timed lad and a, a level, obviously, you go straight across target. Lad, you come in to a point some distance short, and then it programs a pull up to 45 degrees nose high, and the bomb comes off, and the parachute comes out, and that gives you time to escape and things like that. So those were the two deliveries. But you had timers for those things, and you had to adjust the timers for the wind, and you had to find the target on the radar, which wasn't 
a terribly good target unless there was a radar reflector sitting on top of your target. And when the five mile bomb strobe got to the target, you pickled, back seat or pickled. I think the front seat or pickled too. Make sure somebody was on the pickle button the whole time. And then you executed that program. So uh, a pretty basic style of airplane in, in all the air to ground modes and the air to air mode. F4D, as I said, on the outside looked almost exactly the same. Still no gun. Um, but now you had a couple things in there that were different. You had a lead computing optical sight. Not great, certainly by today's standards, pretty, pretty rudimentary, but it was lead computing and it did do a fair job. And you also had a thing called a WRCS, which is a weapons release computer system. And it started giving you a couple computer delivery modes for both conventional and nuclear type deliveries. So air to ground first. You still had the depressible gun sight, you know, manually depressible where you have to be on altitude, airspeed, dive angle, everything right, pickle or make some type of correction. Now they introduced this thing called dive toffs. And what it did was it commanded the radar to bore sight. So the radar is sort of looking through the pepper. And on the radar scope, you got a return. And depending on your dive angle, the steep, steeper the dive angle, the less the return, the shallower the dive angle, the more return it was seeing across the ground. And the back seater locked on to that, just like you would an air to air target. And the radar theoretically was going to sense the center of that which was the strongest point of the return, the center of the beam. And it would then compute delivery and you would pickle and you would pull and the computer would release the bomb where it thought the bomb needed to be released in order to go hit the target. Sounded great. Didn't work worth a dart. Some of them, you know, when you had that return and you locked on, you could kind of see the radar breathing in there as it's looking for that strongest point of the return. And if you had a good system, it it would bomb as good as maybe slightly better than manual bombing. But if you had a bad system, it was just, you know, you were talking maybe a thousand feet short or long. And because you couldn't risk that thousand feet short or long, almost everybody just used manual because it on, on the whole, it was better. And that led to some problems later on that we can talk about later, I guess. Uh, dive toss scandals with pencil whipping squares because the system wasn't good enough. And every six months we said we weren't going to do it again. And then we ended up doing it again. And I think Holloman was the unit that got into trouble for it. But we could have all been in trouble for it. Um, in the back seat for the nukes in a D model, you now had things that you could put on offsets. So you could find one point, if your target was like a no-show target or a minimum show target, you could put in offsets from something that you were pretty sure was going to show up, you know, maybe even a mountain peak or a factory or something like that. And you'd refine your cursors on that. You'd go freeze, refine the cursors, and when you're ready, you went target insert, and the cursors jump to the where the actual target should be. If you could see the target, you could update on the target. If you couldn't see the target, that was as good as you got. And once again, the timers came in, but it wasn't from a five mile point. A lot of times it was just from a point, a couple thousand feet short of the pull up, just maybe one second short. So you'd get a beep and then beep and you'd be in the pull for it. So noticeably better delivery on the nuke side not a whole lot better delivery on the conventional side. Air to air, significantly better. Again, not good compared to to um, the category four fighters, generation four fighters that they got today. Certainly, you know, I have no idea what the generation five fighters are, but from what I've heard, they're magic. So, um, but it was lead computing. And if you get down and get stabilized with it, now you were hitting the dart. 50% of the time, maybe a little more. And of course, the darts only got a five foot wingspan at the base. It's 15 feet long and it goes to about one foot up at the point. So if you're hitting the dart with one or two bullets, you're probably putting 10 bullets in a real airplane because they're so much bigger.
So the lead computing optimal site was a was a, a good advancement on that. Jump now to the hard wing E. Um, it had a gun in the nose. It had a better lead computing optical site. And although the um, the controls and everything for the WRCS were the same, as I recall, I think the logic in the computer had been updated a little bit. It seemed to be a little bit more accurate. So now you've got in the conventional weapons delivery, you've still got the manually depressible site that everybody used. You still have dive toss that nobody used because it was so unreliable. Back seat, you still had the WRCS with freeze and target insert. Uh, air to air, you had a better lead computing site. But now you had a gun that was bolted into the airplane, so it was much more accurate. When you went out to the range with that, you still shot a sighter burst, but it almost always was really, really close. And then you just unloaded on the next two. Um, let's talk about landing the planes for a second. Because the F-4 landing was about as easy to land as you could get. All of those three airplanes, Seas, Ds, and Hard Wing Es, had leading edge flaps with boundary layer control blown air into them when the flaps were out to keep the laminar flow going over the wings. So when you came in to land, you didn't really pull the power off because if you pulled the power off, the BLC went away and the airplane just dropped. So what you did was you just kept the power on the airplane and when it hit ground effect, the nose of the F-4 tended to drop. And so you just came back on the stick enough to hold the nose where it was. And that kind of cushioned it right on the runway. It was a very easy airplane to land. After you got the hang of it, you could actually time it to where you were doing just a little flare with the power still on it or almost all the power on it. And you'd hit full aft stick just about the time the wheels would touch down. Uh, very good in crosswinds. Very, very good, easy airplane to land. Let's go to the slack for a second. The F-4s didn't turn very well. They had this limit uh, angle of attack. It wasn't actually a limit, but it was a goal. 19.2 units angle of attack was what they were calling the best lift you could get out of the wing. And I think the lift curve on that one did drop off after 19.2. And then later on, it went back up. But the drag out there was so much, it was an un unusable portion of the curve. So 19.2, that's what you did when you were fighting. You tried to get to 19.2 and hold it there. And you had lights that told you if you were fast or slow or on speed. The donut was on speed. And you had oral tones in your headset. And even for landing, 19.2. Now, don't, don't ask me where 19.2 came from. They obviously just put the gauge in before they saw what the airplane would do, because logically it would be one or a hundred or something like that. But 19.2 was, was the magic number for it. It didn't turn real well at that. It did bleed airspeed. Obviously, we were learning in Vietnam, MiG-21s and things were turning an awful lot better than it was. And so they, they decided to try to increase the turns with it a little bit. So they came out with the F-4E LES leading edge slat. So instead of leading edge flaps, they had leading edge slats that were variable in flight, that were automatic. Boundary layer control went away, so landing was different. Um, it also had the 556 five, mod on it. Slats first. Like I said, they were automatic, so they did give you better turn, but they also had more drag. So you turn better, but but you did have a drag problem. It wasn't as bad as the CD or hard wing E, but it was there. Um, the limit on this thing was 25 units angle of attack. And once again, what they said was they said the curve went up to 25 and continued going up. But the drag curve went up so much more above 25 that they said they arbitrarily kind of selected 25s as opposed to 24.8 or something weird like that. And that was the on speed in the uh, in the F4E, the slatted E. The 556 five, mod was a huge benefit. Uh, like I said, I've got the, the pen and ink drawing of the F4E cockpit back behind me. And it would be hard to see, but you had switches down by your left knee. You had them... Um, uh, in the center console for, and, uh, and missiles up above it. And the gun sight was up here. 
And so there were a lot of switches that you had to switch if you were going to change from like air to air to air to ground. The 556 mod took one of the things it gave was an auto acquisition capability, which meant there was one switch, the front seater could command the radar to bore sight and lock on a target. Before that, he either had to ask the backseater to lock on the bore, go to bore sight, put the target in the pipper, the backseater would see it and lock on. Or if he wasn't in the pipper, you know, you had to go, he's on the nose 20 high, on the nose 30 high, and the backseater's back there and stab out trying to get the elevation 30 high and seeing if he can get a pain on this guy to lock him up, which was really tough. So the ability to auto acquisition somebody in order to be able to get a radar missile shot was significant. Uh, you also had a switch on your pinky switch. Um, go back to the C and the D for a second and the hard wing E. To switch from a radar missile to a heat missile, there were switches, four switches down by your knee. And one of them was radar heat or heat reject. And we always used to have about a two inch piece of oil tube that we'd stick on the end of that thing so that we could find that easily if we were looking outside, we wanted to go from radar to heat. The 556 mod had a switch outboard of the left throttle that you worked with your pinky switch and forward was radar missile, middle was heat missile, aft was guns. So that started taking, uh, you know, taking you away from doing a lot of this manual stuff in the cockpit trying to change switches to where you could now do a lot of stuff with your hands on the stick and throttles. Tizio. The AIM-7 missile was designed for like a, a head-on longer range shot. Um, but you've got a problem if you've got an airplane coming down at you. Who is he? You know, at 10 miles, who is he? Can I shoot him or not? Um, so they had to try to figure out ways to ID these guys. And before Tizio or some of the other electronic means that came along a little later and that are now in effect now, what you do is if you had two F4s and there was a target coming down at you, we did what we called either a shooter eyeball or a lag hook ID. They were the same thing. You'd get the thing, lead might just take him nose on, two would take him out as uh, far on the, out on the scope as you could, maybe 50 degrees, try to get some separation. Lead would be going underneath of him as two's coming back in. He'd go underneath of him and say, you know, like MiG-21 cleared to fire. And hopefully two maybe was outside of the min range of the AIM-7, which was two miles on the front, one mile beam, a half a mile stern. And you could get that AIM-7 off front quarter. So it was, it was, it was certainly doable 2v1. But when you started getting into 2v2s, 2v4s, things like that, it, it certainly wasn't an ideal situation. So they came up with this thing, Tizio, Telescopic Identification System electro optic, 10 power um, <laughs> telescope sitting out in the left wing route, slave to the radar most of the time, but not all the time. So one of the things you did go into the area was each one dropped back behind the other and you locked them up and you saw where the Tizio was and you had little adjustment knobs on it so you could move it left, move it up. High add, low subtract, I think, house, and you'd get him to where it'd be bore sighted with the radar so that when you were out there and you locked him up, you could switch to this Tizio picture and see what he was far enough away that you could get off a front quarter M7 shot. That was great, but there was a little bit of a downside to it in that that telescope sitting out there added a little drag to the left side and it, it added, um, killed a little bit of lift. So when you got that thing to really high angle of attack, it would just tend to roll into that left wing just a little bit. You had to counteract it a little bit. But all in all, it was uh, it was a good thing to have. Like I said, we had about a third of our airplanes that Clark had had them, but there weren't that many of them made. So, And by this time, you know, you're going into 76, 77. They're working on... Uh, well, F-15s are already flying. They were they were flying at Edwards in 72, and F-16s were on the drawing board. So I don't think they were going to put a whole lot more into the F-4. They were putting their money into the 15s and 16s. Air-to-air -air fights. We've talked about this before. Um, F-4C, D, and hard-wing E 
and to some extent the slat, but not as much, had this thing called adverse yaw. So the, if you were low angle of attack, the airplane rolled and turned very well. But when you started to get into high angle of attack, the downgoing aileron that you would want to cause lift to cause the airplane to roll left, the downgoing aileron on the right wing, actually caused more drag than it did lift, which caused the airplane to yaw right, which put the left wing at a higher angle of attack than the right wing, which actually caused the right roll. Uh, hence the name adverse yaw. So the way you counteracted that was you imagined a V sort of like your air, your legs would be in the airplane. And if the stick was forward, you could use the ailerons. But as the stick came back and back, you phased the ailerons out to where when it got back to 19.2, you're not rolling with ailerons at all. You're rolling with rudder. And of course, when you roll with rudder, you put in the rudder, it causes a yaw, then it causes a roll. So there's a little bit of lag in all this. It's it's not nearly as precise as it is if you're rolling with the aileron. But that was, uh, and and we had three augmentation systems, pitch, roll, and yaw. And you always, for air to air, turn the roll log off um, because it would try to stabilize this thing instead of allowing you to freely roll with it. So those were some of the things on air to air and air to ground that, uh, that, the F4 did and some of its nuances throughout of it. There was one mod that I didn't fly, and that was the um, what they called the Arni Bird, the ARN 101, and it was a um, improved navigation system. I, I don't know if it's improved INS or if it had any GPS in it or not, but I, I didn't fly that. And I'm not very aware of it, but but that was the only mod I think significant mod that I didn't fly. Well. That's an excellent summary and a lot for, a lot for me to dig into and unpack. So more than question. you wanted, wasn't it? No, 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 no. I could I was thinking, God, I hope he keeps going because it's brilliant. Um the less I talk, the better, generally. Uh that's what my wife says. So uh, <laughs> so so just talk about engines for a minute. J seventy nines, the through all series of, of F fours, any differences in those uh, throughout the C D and E? The um I forget the exact designation, but I think the C and the D had the same engine. They were like the the J seventy nine dash fifteen and the E model had the J seventy nine dash seventeen. The E model was a little bit heavier. Uh as I recall, max takeoff gross for an F four C and a D was like 40, 46 or 54. And the E model max takeoff gross was either 54 or 60. And those three numbers stick in my mind. I can't remember which ones are associated with which. But the E model was definitely heavier. Uh, slats were heavier than the, than the leading edge flaps were, and the gun was in the nose. And uh, so they put bigger engines with about 2,000 pounds each more thrust in them in the E model. Airplanes seemed to perform very similar. Although I think the E model a little bit little bit better in performance because of the increased thrust. Let's let's go right back then to the beginning of your recollections, which was saying that you were flying the airplane in 1972, I think you said, and the unit you were initially flying with got uh, packed off to Southeast Asia. Were you expecting to go to war in the airplane? Yeah, we all were. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think in the summer of 72, I don't remember if we actually got orders or if they just came down and told us we were all going. That's where you expected to go. You know, that's just where all RTs expected to go. But then they were starting to have some peace talks. And um, somewhere around October, November 72, they changed most of our orders. I think some guys still went to Southeast Asia, maybe maybe more the back seaters than the front seaters, but a lot of us went to Europe, and that's where why in, I ended up at Bentwaters. Hmm. What were the guys coming back from? Because presumably some of the, the instructors that you had at the RTU were experienced combat veterans at that point, or combat pilots at that point but what were they saying to you about the f4 and its performance you've already highlighted issues around being able to identify um whether or not you can shoot somebody as an example of a, a limitation in the airplane um and you've already identified the fact that the migs were turning better than the f4 so what were they teaching you to do i mean 
Were, were you in the, in the RTU? Were you just being taught to fly the aeroplane to a basic level, um, or were they actually trying to get you ready for war? Um, flying it to a basic level with a little bit of advanced stuff flying, but more of the advanced stuff just in briefings. Uh, they knew the airplane had limitations. I mean, everybody knew it. I forget how many sorties, a thousand sorties or something, they flew against the Paul Domer Bridge in ha Hanoi, and and didn't and all they did was knock the dust off of it. Until, and one of the things they were working on then was lasers, and l laser systems came out, and I forget the order of them: paved knife, paved spike, paved this or that. But they sent two airplanes up there with one of the first generations of laser, and those two airplanes dropped the bridge. So they knew that terminal guidance was was the way to go, that manually delivered bombs wasn't going to do anything. It was better than it was in World War II. In World War II, obviously, they couldn't hit anything. That's why they went to carpet bombing. They said, let's not try to hit the target. We never hit the target. Let's just try to hit something short and deliver a bunch of stuff through it. Maybe a couple of them hit the target. Well, we were better than that in Vietnam. They didn't do carpet bombing in Vietnam. You know, that's very ineffective because you're wasting a lot of ordnance doing nothing. But uh, so they knew things were, were getting were not good. And that's why they were trying to improve things. And that laser thing was uh, was was, you know, one of the big breakthroughs from Vietnam. Going back to that laser just a second and dive toss. If you had an F4E where you could put that laser range in the WRCS computer for dive toss instead of the radar range, that dive toss system started working pretty well. It was then significantly, consistently better than a manual delivered bomb. And obviously, that would have been the potted variety, wouldn't it? Because I think the first lasers were just pointing out of the canopy, weren't they? They were mounted on the the wizard's canopy at the back. Weren't, weren't they? Uh, or was that the sighting well, mechanism? Sorry, that was the sighting mechanism. So the pod was, the paved knife was under the aeroplane and the sighting for it was uh, through the left-hand side. Does that ring a bell? Mate, I, I never flew a paved knife. I did fly paved spike at weapons school. And it was a pod that set, I think, in one of the gear, in one of the missile wells. And it had a gimbaled head. And there were a couple different ways you could acquire a target. One was um, 12 acquire or nine acquire. 12 acquire was front seater could put it in the pipper. The back seater could get it and start tracking. And it was gyro stabilized. So it was fairly easy to track. The other was nine acquire. And this was, if I remember correct, you know, this was where you would um, nine acquire where your viewers can see this. So what would happen is in the arming area, you would go to nine acquire on this pod and this pod would look out there at something and the back seater would take a grease pencil and he would look at it with his normal seating position and he'd close one eye and he'd put a circle around the target and then he'd close the other eye and it would be a little different. He'd put a square around that one. And so when you went to nine acquire, he just went through that and, and looked to the point where the circles and the squares matched up. And that was the, where the pod was looking for nine acquire. And it worked fairly well. It very simple, but it worked fairly well. Did you have uh, going back to the air to air side of things? Then noting your reference to the was it the Su sixteen gun pod? Was that the name of the, the gun pod that you were talking about? They uh, we had two of them: um, Su sixteen and Su twenty three. Did Did you have any confidence that if if huh? you were going to go into a conflict? Do you have any confidence? Because you said you couldn't hit the dart with it. It was, a, it was very hit or miss, mostly miss. But do you have any confidence in that system as a something you would have to go and use in a, in a wartime situation? Yeah, it worked all the time. It worked great. It shot six thousand, you know, hundred rounds a second, six thousand rounds a minute. I never had one jam or malfunction. Uh, the most you could shoot at a time was three hundred rounds because otherwise the barrels would get so hot they'd start to to, to deform and melt. When you went to the range, the air to ground range to shoot for strafe, typically you looked for about a hundred or 125 rounds. But like when we would go to Aviano or uh, Zaragoza to shoot, once they loaded rounds into these gun pods, either one, the Su-16 or the Su-23, and one I think was driven by ram air turbine and the other I think was hydraulic, hydraulic or maybe electric. Um, you couldn't tell the difference from the cockpit. They both worked great. 
uh, once they uploaded ammo into these things, they couldn't download the ammo and use it again. So if you were at the last flight of like Aviano and the airplane uh, Friday afternoon, the airplane was going home tomorrow and they were going to take the gun pods home in the C-130 so you didn't lug them over France, the, the weapons crew chief out in the Army area, he'd have his notes here that he's theoretically looking at. And when he got done, he'd flip it upside down and on the back and say, fire it all. <laughs> so so you'd go out there and you might shoot 500 rounds, you know, and the last burst, you know, 300 rounds. And you're out there shooting at four or five, you know, three or 4,000 feet from the target. And the first bullets haven't hardly started hitting the target by the time you, you, the guns go on empty. And then they just start walking, you know, 300 rounds through this target. So, but the gun pods work well. They shot. They shot where they were pointing. It was just a matter of whether you knew where they were pointing. Yeah, I'd, I'd heard from some RAF guys. You know, they were flying the F4J, and then you know we, we had our own designations after the those early airplanes arrived with us. But that they weren't that keen on the pod because of the dispersal of the rounds. So, notwithstanding the inability to bore sight it, um, I think that they they felt that because when the pod fired, it would sort of shimmy a little and, and move around on those mounting lugs you ended up with quite a wide dispersal pattern was that a view you shared i didn't notice that all that much it looked like a pretty good pretty good pattern to me and you know if you're going against something like a, a truck or a pol storage or something a little bit of dispersal isn't bad mm -hmm. gets you a little bit more area coverage but i didn't notice significantly better dispersal in an e-model than in the c or the d or in the f-16 they, you know, same gun, they all tended to shoot about the same. And the whole airplane shakes. You know, the, the F-16 gun sits on your left shoulder, shoots over your left shoulder and just outside of it. And if you look at uh, video and things of it, when you're shooting the gun, the whole, the whole airplane is vibrating. Yeah. Go back to air to air then, uh, Gabby. What were these guys saying to you about engagements with MiGs then? Was there a view that you should, if you were going to go, you would be expected to actively try not to get into an engagement? Or was there a more aggressive fangs out type approach where you were going to do it, but there were things you were going to have to avoid and things that you were going to have to make sure you did do? Everybody wanted to shoot down a MiG. You know, if there was a, if there was a MiG in the area, if you were going to the target and you had on 18 Mark 82s or something, six, six, 12 Mark 82s, uh, you're not going to do much maneuvering, okay? If he flies out in front of you, and I, I've known guys that have done that. I, I had a friend who was in the back seat in Vietnam, and they're flying around and going into the target, and this guy, front seater says to this friend of mine in the back seat, a MiG just flew in front of me. And George says, shoot him. And he calls up a, an aim, aim nine, gets a tone, shoots him, shoots the guy down. Didn't turn more than 25 degrees or so. So those things happened occasionally. What they knew was going into the targets, if they were in the air to ground mode, they didn't want to get engaged because they would, they couldn't maneuver unless they jettisoned their bombs. And if they jettisoned their bombs, the MiG's done his job right there because you're not going to destroy anything. So they knew you had to go in. They knew you had to have enough self-defense capability to survive attacks. They knew the MiGs attacked from 6 o'clock. Uh, they knew they were primarily like MiG-21s and MiG-19s and 17s. And, and, you know, we knew things like we had, we had reports that said all attempts to break into a MiG-19 results in guns tracking, and yet, you know, Randy Cunningham, who was one of the Navy aces, in fact, reverses and gets into a scissors with a MiG-19 and wins it. Um, and, and when they ask him why he did that, he see, it just seemed like the thing to do at the time. And so sometimes it's things like, hey, interesting that Randy Cunningham got all five of his kills with AIM-9s, if I remember correctly, and Steve Ritchie, who, got, who was the front seat ace um, for us, for the Air Force, got all five of his kills with AIM-7s. And probably to give due that uh, Willie Driscoll, as I recall, was the was um, uh, Randy Cunningham's backseater, 
and we had two backseat aces, Jeff Feinstein and uh, Chuck Bellevue. And who? Was it Ch- Chuck Chuck Be- Chuck Bellevue. Belleville? De Bellevue, yeah, De Chuck Bellevue. De Bellevue. So, but uh, but yeah, those things they they knew that a lot of this stuff happened on the intercept, that the MIGs were vectored into six o'clock, and that they'd come in trail, and that if you saw one, there might be another guy back behind, and they knew the engagements were very short over there. Um, you know, if you listen to Steve Ritchie, uh, I've I listened to one of his uh, speeches. And on one of his missions, I think he got two kills on one mission, and the whole engagement lasts like a minute and 29 seconds. So it's it's fast. Um, wingman at the time, we were still flying a thing called Fighting Wing. You ever heard of that? Yeah. So numbers two and four are the primary shooters in this thing. What I say, one and three are the primary shooters, two and four are the wingmen. So if you're here as a wingman number four, three's doing his thing and you're just trying to hold on and your job is to clear his six o'clock. Well, the pilot in this thing isn't clearing six o'clock at all. He's just hanging on trying to get to where he can stay in, in you know, 1500 feet away from this guy. The backseater might be checking six, but it was a terribly ineffective use of two airplanes, just having them hang on. And later on, then after Vietnam, we started saying, you know, we got to give the wingman some credit. You know, he's got a brain. We, we got to loosen this thing up and, and, and fly a little bit more of a fluid type two as opposed to welded wing. So that's primarily what, what they were saying. We, the wingmen were holding on. The engagements weren't long. A lot of them were hit and run tactics by the MiGs. Air to ground going in, you couldn't afford to get engaged with them. Coming back out, if you were clean and they saw somebody, they were probably going to go after them. Hmm. You, you talked about the VID uh, through Tizio and the challenges of of um, identifying uh, a bogey and, and therefore being able to call it a bandit. Uh, infamously, the Air Force released one of those kill takes where the backseat is saying he's corking MIG. And I think it was thereafter that they declassified or they admitted to the existence of combat tree. Was that, was that system? Did you have that at that point in the training pipeline? Was it any good? Could you trust it and rely on it? I don't remember if we had it or not. I know we did not train with it. Uh, We knew they were using that. And, um, Of course, they had the thing called T-Ball, which was a radar ship sitting out in the Gulf. And of course, if you get two airplanes taken off out of Kep Airfield or something, you can pretty much tell they're hostile, mm-hmm. you know, declare hostile based on point of origin. And so that was some of the ways that they could declare airplanes hostile and track them and clear airplanes to fire beyond visual range. And I think Steve Ritchie had one of those, if I'm not mistaken where his target was declared hostile at like 60 miles. So there there were things being used. They knew that was a problem. They were working it. And, you know, they've continued to work it. And they've got systems, you know, better than that now. So Did it make a big difference? I mean, I'm asking you some quite Vietnam-specific uh, questions, but I, I suppose this knowledge would have been uh, infused in, through the, the training pipeline or at least um, – certainly when you went through the weapons school. But but did that make a big difference than that long-range enhanced ID of, of a threat, um, given the limitations of something like the Sparrow at the time? So, you know, quite a high failure rate, uh, not particularly successful. Um, I mean, did even if you got a 60-mile EID, would you still end up in a potentially in, in, a, in a knife fight? Well, you'd try not to. Uh, if you had a 60-mile ID... We always train to shoot sparrows in pairs. Squeeze, release, squeeze, and hold. And that committed two. I've heard different things. I've heard that the the PK of a sparrow was around 25%. I've also heard it was down around 10%. But it wasn't real good. And there's a lot of things has to be done that has to go right in this thing. You know, the radar has to maintain lock on the target. 
the missile has to come out of the missile well right. The battery has to work, has to fire the gas grain generators for the fins. The missile seeker has to see the radar energy coming back from the airplane. The airplane's got to maintain lock all the time. The missile's got a, which is a big missile, 500 pound missile, looks like a small, man, big fence post, small telephone pole, has to come off, has to guide on this thing. When it gets in close, the fuse has to work, the warhead has to detonate, and a significant portion of the warhead has to hit the target. Now, the warhead on an AIM-7 had expanding rod in it, which was, uh, you've seen these carpenter um, measuring things that fold up, that are about a foot, you unfold them. to see. Well, that's kind of what like what expanding rod is. And when the warhead blows up, this thing just expands on out in this big expanding rod, and anything that goes through, it just saws through. So if the warhead hits it, it's probably coming down. There are good missiles and there are bad missiles. There are some missiles that will guide from slightly outside the envelope, and some missiles won't guide from the heart of the envelope. Um, I shot one AIM-7E2 missile at Clark, 90 degrees on the beam, with uh, just getting ready to get the back, the brake X, the back seater yelling at me, don't shoot, don't shoot. I pickle, you know, trigger this missile off. I feel it pop out of the well. It's like a 500 pounder coming off the airplane. And then you see this thing and your viewers aren't going to miss, but it goes out in front of the, in front of my airplane and it's just a wham right across my nose and starts hidden for this target. And it was a zero foot miss. They take the warhead out of the missiles for things like that. It got within a foot of the target, uh, but didn't actually hit it because they don't want to destroy their drones for every missile that's fired. So good missiles and bad missiles, shoot them in pairs, but you always got to be prepared. You know, even today, you got to be prepared for what happens if that missile goes stupid. Hmm. Were you in, in some respects then disappointed to be sent to Alconbury? Uh, I went to Bentwaters. Oh, sorry, Bentwaters, yeah. Yeah, Alconbury was a recce base at the time. Uh, yeah, was. I think we all were a little bit. You know, the, the American people, the taxpayers, had spent a lot of money to train us, to get us to that point, and they deserve to see some return on their investment. Plus, you know, when you're in the service, that's what you're expected to do. So it'd, it'd be like people joining the Army five or ten years ago and not, not expecting to go to Afghanistan. You know, you know you're going even before you sign up on the papers. You said that you said that at Alkenbury then you were at Bentwaters. God, I keep saying that. Uh, at Bentwaters, uh, you were a multi-role squadron, and one of the roles you had was was nuclear strike. So, did you have a particular target you were going to go over? Were you part of the single integrated operating plan? Everybody was part of the, the psyop single integrated operation plan. Um, you do that for deconfliction. You know, right. you don't want to be flying over a place when one of your own nukes goes off and blows you out of the air. Um, so, yeah, we we were part of the PSYOP. We had, I don't know what our squadron had. We might have had 30 targets. But three of our targets, and I'm pretty sure none of this is still classified. I won't go into detail on Three of our targets were our primary targets. Each squadron, the 81st wing, which was at Bentwaters, had two squadrons at Bentwaters, the 91st and 92nd, and one squadron about five miles away at RAF Woodbridge, which was at 78. And we each had three airplanes on FGLQ, first generation level Q, which was the normal standard day-to-day -day posture, 24-7. And we all, those nine targets sort of stayed the same. Um, but there were ways in the message that came down when the horn blew you went to the airplane and you prepared to start to copy this message and there were portions in the message where they could delete certain things they could delete countries like let's say one of the countries in the Warsaw Pact knew this was coming and they contacted them and they said, we want to come to your side. You know, we're not, we're not going to fight a war against you. They wanted to be able to delete that. They wanted to be able to delete. There were some targets like right in the middle of cities. 
like the Czechoslovakian Air Defense District headquarters was in downtown Prague, as I recall. And they wanted to be able to delete cities over certain population groups. Uh, so there were ways that that could happen. And if that happened, then someone else might bring you out another two things, usually a CMS and an MPS. MPS was the mission planning section, about that thick. And it had a bunch of stuff in it you could look through. And the CMS was the combat mission section that had your route of flight, your times, your uh, time on target, things like that in it. So you had a primary targets that you you knew you were going after. They were the high value targets, even though we expected to be the third weapon on target on each one of those. And um, but there were other targets assigned to the wing. And you could get any one of those targets at any time if your line was deleted. Was it a um, a mission that weighed on your mind at all? Yeah, you know you you knew you know Hiroshima and Nagasaki were in the fifteen to twenty thousand um, kiloton range. And our weapon had variable yields. We didn't go with the high yield. We were at a mid yield, but it was still in the area of, of 60 kilotons. So you know you're going to kill an awful lot of people with this thing. Uh, you know you, when you come back to base, your base might not be there. Your home might not be there. I, I remember one Christmas Eve, I was on alert. We sat alert seven days a month, usually two days during the week, then another two during the week, then one weekend. And I was on alert on Christmas Eve, and I walked outside the alert facility, and of course we had all our hangars there, bathed in lights with double rows of fencing around us, and it's coming up on Christmas Eve, and I can hear the church bells in the different towns around ringing and things like that, and it was a crystal clear cold night, and you can kind of look you know, down the runway and stuff and, and look at the stars. And it was just a very surreal feeling for Christmas Eve. Did they have, uh, so those aeroplanes were sitting in hangars at a particular part of, of the base then. Uh, presumably there were armed guards or, or, you know, were you living in some kind of something attached to the TAV or the house or the PAS or whatever it was called? Uh, it was in the center of the area, the alert facility. And it had a TV room six bedrooms, two people to a room, a shower, a cafeteria, a duty officer thing. And so that's where you lived. Uh, during the day, you could go away from there with a the radio and stuff. You had to be able to get back to there in a couple minutes. You could go to the squadron. You could even go to the BX or the commissary. Um, but you were always on alert. If, if there was an alert, there were loudspeakers throughout the whole base. And they would come on, you know, phantom, 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 local gun smoke, exercise, alpha traffic. And and you just, if you were in the BX ready to pay for something, you just dropped it and left. Everybody ran out the door, jumped in the trucks. We had radios with uh, with tower. They'd close the runway for us so we could go across the runway to get to the alert facility faster. And you went from there. And yeah, guards, There were there were two guards at every hangar. One in the front and one in the back. It wasn't a tab V. It was just uh, like a barn. Sides and a top. The front and the back were open back then. And uh, so there was a guard in the front. He had a little guard shack, guard in the back. And then there was a main guard shack at the road where you drove in. And, and then there were some other guards around the perimeters. Hmm. What about from a flying point of view then? Was that mission particularly demanding? You've, you've described some of the technique around being able to get the weapon onto the target. But were you going to go in low? Were you, were you going to be really pressed for gas? Did it require lots of target study and knowledge of route? On your primary line, you had that pretty much memorized. All the headings, distances, times, things like that, the radar offset points, everything, the visual identification points, that was all memorized. Um yeah, it was a low-level attack, and the altitude was depending upon uh, obstacles because you were going to fly this thing regardless whether you were IFR or VFR, whether the weather was good or the weather was bad, day or night, you're going to fly this thing. Um, 
rockets, red glare, bombs bursting in air. There's going to be nukes going off everywhere, you know, and we were going to fly this with an eye patch on. Because if you got a nuclear flash in front of you, it could blind you. Now, when you fly with one eye, I never flew with one. I never did that in training or anything else. You lose your death perception. You know, you're going to be reaching out for switches and not knowing where they are and things like that. And having a hard time seeing how far away you are from the ground if you're going lower than than what the plan was. And so, yeah, it was a, it was going to be a tough mission. A lot of people weren't going to get to there. Um, gas. From where we were in England, I don't think any of our lines had enough gas to get back to England. They all programmed us to land somewhere in Germany or France or Denmark or wherever else. You didn't need that much gas. You needed enough gas for 40 seconds after the bomb came off. It was called B&E, Burst and Escape. And if you had enough gas to make it to there, even though you were going to flame out right there, you were expected to fly that mission and put that bomb on target. Really? Did you did you go through that in your in your mind then? How obviously, you know, the ramifications of being part of a, a nuclear retaliation or whatever it was is is one thing. But from a personal point of view, did you go? Th- did you do any study of the areas where you might end up punching out? And were you thinking about what will I do? I mean, did you? Did you I don't want to say did you take it seriously because of course you did. But did you take the the possibility that it would actually happen seriously? We did. I mean, every day when we when we sat alert, we knew it was a possibility that could happen any time. But we should obviously sure hoped it wouldn't. Um, we had routes and pickup points in uh, in certain areas where they had made contact with certain dissidents who, under certain conditions, might be able to render aid to us. Certain code words that we could exchange with them. Um, Certain things, um, guarantees of money. If you help, this person will give you money. Uh, dictionary, not dictionaries, but sort of a pointy talky type thing where it would have on there, I could point to this. It says, I need food or something. And over on the other side in German or whatever language it would have, he needs food so that you could communicate with people like that. We had certain places that uh, rescue forces might be able to come in and pick us up at, and we'd have to try to make it to those places. So they didn't just give up on you and say, you're going to die. You know, we had to trust the 38 or whatever on our side that, you know, we could hold off the Warsaw Pact with that. (laughs) We figured, we figured we might be able to shoot a rabbit with it or something. So, yeah, you know, you, you weren't totally given up on, but you knew the chances if that really happened, the chances of survival with all the radioactivity stuff around. And, and you know, they tell you things like, uh, you know, if you a- ate a rabbit, eat the meat that's on the outside, not the stuff closest to the bone, because the radioactive stuff closest to the bones is the worst or something like that. So it was, they tried to make the best of what they had, but it wasn't a good hand to play. Yeah. Tell, tell me a bit about flying in the UK then and the air-to-air side of things. So you, I suppose that you know being very well located with the rest of Western Europe uh, on your doorstep was a good thing. Being in a multi-role squadron, did you get a lot of opportunity to do much air-to-air um, and dissimilar training uh, affiliation with other, other uh, fighter types? Officially, we didn't get any dissimilar training. We did do a fair amount of air-to-air. Um, 1v1, 2v1. I'm not sure we did a lot of 2v2, but you damn Brits, you know, you'd go out there and minded your own business and here would come a couple lightnings or things like that. And we had Wadisham just up the road, which we party with occasionally. They had lightnings. So, you know, occasionally we'd meet them out in the area and do some stuff with them. So... There was a lot more back then of uh, the acceptance of some unscheduled stuff, stuff that just happens. And you could do things like, uh, 
I remember one day coming back and, and we had some extra gas and I had a four ship and I tell, I'm going to do a, a gear up low approach into, uh, into Wadisham at 500 knots with a flight of four and fingertip, you know, just to drag the base and let them know we're there. And that was, you know, even the wing, when they found out about it, they didn't, it, there, nothing much was done. Later on, 10 years later, I'd have been probably kicked out of the service. So you you mentioned uh, lightning. It's it's interesting. I mean, I'm, when you were talking about the F four flying the F four um, back at George when you were training, and the fact that the F fifteen was already flying at Nellis, and um, you know the F fourteen was already flying, and the F eighteen wasn't far off, and the F sixteen would be along soon as well, um, and the inherent limitations of the F four. I just wondered, sort of, what sort of mindset you had around air to air then and then i and then you mentioned the lightning and i thought well there were obviously some aircraft at that time that you could probably go out and dominate if you wanted to but given the fact that at that time of course things were changing and the the f4 was beginning to show its age did you have any dirty tricks or any particular things crutches that you would lean on to try and get the upper hand in air combat so you weren't always being thrashed the, the, the only real upper hand trick you had was to get into the fight unobserved, to be the first one attacking. After that, it was just a pure maneuvering thing to go. There was, there was no real uh, uh, super maneuver or something. Uh, remember William Devane in this one movie, Red Flag, where he discovers an inverted ridge line crossing or something like that. And, you know, all the fighter guys are just going, what the hell are they doing? You know, there, there, there's no secret maneuver. There are, there are formulas that cover turn rate and turn radius and, and all things that fly in our atmosphere adhere to those things. And, um, and, and a certain airplane's got a certain wing. It's got certain engines in it and all it can do is the best it can do. So there was no real, real tricks or anything. You couldn't really, um, you know, you could put the flaps down to half. That would give you a little bit, but not much. What was the what was the toughest opponent then that you would face if you were going to get bounced or if you were going to go out and do any kind of air to air? I mean, because you because you bit, at Bitburg you had the F fifteen, so you just said you didn't really sort of do formally dissimilar, but uh, in informally at least. Yeah, Bitburg didn't have F fifteens in seventy two or. I'm not sure when they got them. I left in 76. I know Schusterberg still had F4s, and they were an air-to-air -air unit. Bitburg, I think, I don't, I don't think they'd converted yet. Okay. Most of the time, it was just, you know, whoever whoever came up or showed up. And it might be a buccaneer. You know, we could beat them pretty well. But, uh, but most of the time, a lot of it was just an even thing. It would be a couple turns. Nobody's really getting a big advantage and then a separation from the fight. A lot of it depended upon who had the most gas. If you have gas and you can stick around more and the other guy's got to leave and go home, you'll end up behind him. How did that make you feel then? Because you're, you know, you, you want, you want to win. How, so how did it make you feel being in this airframe where there was so much, well, it feels like there was quite a lot left to chance. Well, there was, you know, a lot of it depended upon the pilots. If you were able to max perform your F4 and the other guy wasn't able to max perform whatever he was fine, you were going to win the thing. So an awful lot of it depended upon the pilot and his training, his aggressiveness, things like that. Um, we did want to win, but more than that, you didn't want to lose. Okay. A neutral fight was better than having a guy behind you. So... Yeah, that's interesting. I was I was talking to somebody recently who was talking about the the current fighter training pipeline, and uh, you know they were saying that the the guys and girls going through that are you know top scholars, top athletes, and and they come into this environment and then they start losing, and it's the first time in their lives uh, where they've experienced those emotions and and the angst that comes with that. So that's an and interesting. And their feelings point. get hurt. Yeah, <laughs> it's very hurtful to them. Uh, <laughs> yeah i think they you have to you have to be humble when you're a fighter pilot because there are days you're going to win and you're going to make the other person feel bad and there's days you're going to lose 
and then you're going to feel bad. That's just part of it. Hmm. What about the the social scene at Bentwaters? Let me ask before I forget, wasn't Bentwaters where there was the UFO sighting or something? Did that come that was after, after you? I left. That was after you left, so you weren't there for that. Okay, we'll move on. So so what about the social scene then? Did you do much social uh, socializing with the RAF guys? Did you go out to watch them and have parties? Uh, you know, sort of um, ex- exchange of booze and, and ideas and that kind of thing. Occasionally, you know, once or twice a year, I'll tell you about the, the one time they invited us up. They, they were paying for the food. We were paying for the booze. Uh, so we go in there, you know, we're throwing a lot of darts and, and having a good time and have a good meal and have some good drinks. And they also had us bring a piano and two picture frames that were like two feet by three feet or something and an axe so after this whole thing's over and we've had all the fun we've thrown the glasses in the fireplace and everything else we go out in front of the o club there at watersham and there's the two pianos sitting there and the two picture frames and the two axes and we a couple guys could play the piano so they're playing the piano and we're singing these old dirty fighter pilot songs and when we get done you, you take the axes and you have to chop the piano up into pieces small enough to fit through the picture frame. And then you set the pianos on fire and you sing your last song while you hear the sirens from the police and the fire come in there. And then you all run for it. <laughs> and there was one guy said, you know, he ran for it. He was hiding in a hedge bush. He fell asleep, didn't wake up till the next morning. <laughs> Did, did you get a chance to do much low level in the UK? The UK is well known for having some pretty good low fly zones. Now, I don't know how far back that stretches historically, but were you doing low level training? Um, yeah, I just got to do one thing. I'm sorry here. I sorry. forgot. Um, yeah, uh, the UK had uh, IR and VR routes around typically the outside of the country. And so you could you had to file flight plans for those. IR was a route you could fly in instrument conditions. VR was a route you fly in visual visual route conditions, and you could fly all around there and fly the low levels. Or they had different low flying areas. Now in the UK proper, some of the low flying areas weren't all that big, but at the time Scotland was a total low fly area, all of Scotland. So you could go up there sometimes and just root around low level wherever you wanted. I used to do monster recce at Loch Ness looking for that monster. Never did find it. <laughs> I think you said that you went from Bentwaters then to Clark. Am I remembering correctly? And, and there you were an air-to-air specialist. So what did that entail, if it's not a stupid question? Uh, normally it would entail... I think it was called 5134, which was our training manual. And you would have a certain number of training events you needed to do every six month period. And that train, those training events were tailored to your mission, which at Clark would have been air to air. But when I was there, we did a thing called the air superiority specialized test. And there was a syllabus that came down from Air Force through PACAF to us that gave us a six month period of very specific couple 1v1, some 2v1, some 2v2s. We had an aggressor unit right there at Clark. They were flying T-38s at the time. We flew against them a lot. Uh, And at the end of the thing, we went to Wessop and shot missiles. And um, one of the interesting things was, I think if you took a normal F-4 squadron, I think they only had, you, you had four Sparrow Wells. Sparrow kind of sits semi-submerged in the F-4. The one fin goes up in the airplane, and it sits there kind of semi-submerged. Only four, though, uh, uh, there's four on the airplane, but in a normal squadron, it'd only be like two or 1.8 of those that were actually capable of launching a missile. Even before you got the missile on board, that missile well just wasn't capable of transmitting the information down to it correctly. In a normal air-to-air unit, I think that number was around 2.5 or so. In our unit, when we went to Wessup and they started checking our missile wells, I think we were at like a 3.25 or something. And that was one of the biggest things that came out of it. Yeah, we were a lot better at air to air, 
but our airplanes were a lot better at air to air. The radars were, were kept better because the maintenance guys knew the systems they were working with every day. Um, every, everything air to air wise was better. And then if I recall, they gave us a short air to ground thing after that to see how we would do air to ground after we'd done nothing but air to air for six months. And I think we bombed better than the average F4 squad air to ground squadron bomb just because we'd gotten so used to flying the airplanes precisely that, um, that we were pretty good at putting them in the piece of space that we needed to, to drop an accurate bomb. But then we went back, we did, we did the air to ground specialized test and we liked that so much. And the training was so good. We created another syllabus for it that I think they called silver bullet or something like that, or golden BB. And we went through that whole thing again and worked up again because at Clark, you were normally there for a year and a half to two years, 15 months to two years, depending on whether it's a company or unaccompanied. And you'd have new people coming in and some of the older guys going out. So that was, uh, but that was a pretty, uh, a pretty detailed, intense training program. Can you talk a little bit about energy management? Uh, I'm guessing you, you referenced a few minutes ago talking about you know, are you on top of your game? Are you having a good day? Can you max perform the aeroplane? But but energy management and then in something like an F4, what, what, is, what does that mean when people talk about energy management? What does it mean? Oh, basically it means keeping the speed up as high as you can keep it for as long as you can keep it there. And there, there are certain things like there was an optimum turn, which I think was 13 to 15, which would give you a fairly good turn rate for less energy bleed. And there was a thing that we used to talk about, the egg. You ever heard about the egg? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of tighter at the top and looser at the bottom. And you'd be hard across this top. You know, you're low airspeed, so you could generate angle of attack, not lose a whole bunch more airspeed. But when you're coming across the bottom, you didn't want to just bleed all your airspeed off coming across the bottom. You wanted to use as optimum a turn as you could to get that in there to keep the airspeed up. Because if you look at turn rate, turn radius charts for an F4, and I know your viewers aren't going to get this at all, but the turn radius chart st starts up here almost infinity as you're in like 100 knots because you can't turn it all. And it comes down at around, I think, uh, around 200 knots and it like flattens out till you get up to a, a around quarter velocity, around 425 or whatever it was. And then it starts going up again because you're G limited. You can't pull more G than your G limit there. So that's what the turn radius looks like. The turn rate on top of that starts out at zero when you're 100 knots because you don't have any turn rate. And it builds and it builds and it builds and it builds till you get to your G limit. And then it starts dropping off because you can't pull any more Gs anymore. And that one point where you get maximum turn rate with minimum turn radius is called corner velocity. And so you'd like to you'd like to operate in that area as much as you can. And what that means a lot of times for the F4 is taking the flight lower. So if you're 15 or 20,000 feet, you can't maintain that very long. But if you get a clean F4 down around 5,000 feet, it it can hold on to 7 Gs for a long time at cor close to corner velocity. Was it difficult to do? Uh, I mean, if you if you compare and contrast your time flying the F4 at Bent Waters and then the time at which you left Clark. Uh, were you a different pilot were you, or were you just a, a, a grade or two better? Uh, well, I'd say two grades better uh, for a couple of reasons. One reason was just because I had more experience and more time in the airplane. And as you go along and you fly more and more, you have more experiences with it and you learn what works and what doesn't work. Uh, and what cues you have. The other part of it was the air to air because we flew air to air, you know, high angles of attack and high G's all the time. You get, you know, you get to where you, uh, you do a mind meld with the airplane. You understand it pretty well. How much of an impact did the backseater have on your performance then in any given saucy you know sometimes i hear good things sometimes i hear not so good things a lot um most of the time when you hear bad things what you'll hear is either an inexperienced wizzo and an experienced pilot who expects more 
And that's what they do. When you get to a unit, they put an experienced pilot with an inexperienced backseater or an experienced backseater with an inexperienced pilot. So the team would keep out of trouble most of the time. So the bad experience is normally what you would get is experienced pilot, inexperienced backseater that hadn't flown together a lot. The, the flying together a lot is important. When we were at Clark doing that air superior to specialized test, we had formed crews and formed elements. Tom Bradley was my backseater, and I flew with him 100, 200 times, almost never with anybody else unless he was on leave or something. My wingman was, was Mike Martin in the front seat and Bill Yalsh in the back. And the number of times I saw on the schedule, Drake, Bradley, Martin, and Yalsh, we were just together all the time. So there wasn't much miscommunication. And the communication we did, we did with much shorter sentences. Because after a while, if Mike said something to me 10 times and I said the same thing back to him or did the same thing 10 times, eventually everybody realizes we don't really need that. We know what's going to happen. It's happened 10 times in a row. So the formed crew, formed element system where you fly with one guy or one wingman all the time really makes that team better. Can you talk a bit, Gabby, about the PACAF mission then? Uh, well, not the PACAF mission, but the mission of the squadron at Clark. Um, it was kind of interesting because I talked to Scotty Scott you know, a couple of years ago, uh, I think for a program I put together on a little documentary I did on the, on the aggressors. And one of the questions I'd asked him was whether, because he was flying F-4s at Seymour in about 1974, 75, if I remember right. And I'd said to him, well, what did you know about who you're going to go up against about the threat and, and the man and, you know, the, the airplane and the capability. And he said that they never really gave it any thought at that time. They were just in their own little world flying their F-4s against each other, not really thinking about who they were going to go up against. And I wondered if that was similar for you. Were you looking at the Chinese or, you know, who, who was the threat? What did you know about them? Were you concerned about them or were you just doing your own thing? Uh, no, not doing your own thing. In, in England, we were concerned with uh, Russia and the Warsaw Pact. And there were things on the walls, framed things on the walls that says, know your enemy, he knows you. And they had pictures of the different airplanes and what his armament was, what his weight was, you know, how much gas, how much he weighed, all that stuff, trying to get you things. Intel would come in periodically and give Intel briefings on any things that had been noticed or, you know, different things that they'd been doing training on their side of the border. Uh, when they were first developing AWACS, they bought an early AWACS to Europe. And the AWACS on this particular day was like controlling all of American forces in Europe. And so they're, instead of being handed off to uh, Eastern radar or whatever, uh, for to go to, to Holbrook or Wainfleet, we'd be handed off to the AWACS. And they're doing that in Germany and they're doing it everywhere. And they're also, at the end of this thing, they're tracking Russian fox bats doing, you know, 1300 knots over Poland or something like that. So that was our our concern, and that was our focus, our total focus, in Europe. In PACAF, at the time, the focus was North Korea. Uh, we, had, we had things going on, you know, we had a lot of bases in South Korea. It was around this 76, 77 time frame where they had the uh, tree cutting incident in the, in, um, the, the buffer zone there where North Korean troops killed a couple uh, U.S. people trimming in this tree. And we were, we were in the process of loading up our airplanes with AIM-7s and AIM-9s and ready to go when they kind of called that off. Um, Russia had a little bit to do down there. There was a Tu-95 bear who used to leave Vladivostok. I think it was like every Tuesday. He'd come down to 198 miles from Guam, turn around and go back home. One week he misses the turn and comes down to 12 miles from Guam and turns around and goes home. The next Tuesday, we're sitting there with four F-4Es with four AIM-7s, four AIM-9s and a gun waiting for him. He comes down 198 miles and he turns around and goes home. So mostly Korea, but a little bit of Russia in there too for Pakistan. What, 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 what? But China, I don't remember us 
thinking at all about China back then. What did you know about the North Koreans then in terms of their capabilities? Uh, I think, I can't remember if they, they definitely had MiG-17s, they might have had MiG-19s, they definitely had MiG, a load of MiG-21s. What did you know about their competencies and their capabilities? Uh, we knew they didn't get to fly all that much. Uh, we knew they probably weren't all that good. We also knew there was a chance there'd be Russian pilots involved in it, you know, clandestinely. Uh, we knew where their air bases were. We knew what their armament was. Uh, so we, and you know, we had intel briefs on that. Typically, you get an intel brief one or two a month on uh, capabilities, anything that's going on, things like that. More, more than that, if there were things uh, happening quicker. Did you, would you expect that 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 any, you know, if you take the the tree cutting incident? Um, as an example, and you were getting ready to potentially go and do something, were you expecting it to be a walkover then? To be a what? A walkover. Did you think it was going to be easy? Uh, you never underestimate somebody. You know, our exchange ratio in North Vietnam against the North Vietnamese, which basically was a third world country, wasn't all that good. So we had learned from that. We were prepared for it, but I don't think I don't think anybody expected us to go up there and and take control of their skies on day one and own own their sky forever. You know, I think everybody knew that that there was going to be losses, although we knew we were probably going to do a lot better than they did in Vietnam. Hmm. Tell us about the weapons school, then. Going through the weapons school in the F four, what what stands out as in in your mind from from that experience? Uh, a lot of academics, a lot of hard flying. Uh, I enjoyed it. I had a good time at weapons school. But like I said, I'd just come out of an air-to-air -air unit flying slat at ease with the 5.56 mod. Some of the guys had come out of F4Cs or Ds and never flown a slat before. And I think they got one ride for familiarization and then they're in the air-to-air -air thing. It was very important to do well in air-to-air -air in the F4 weapons school. If you did poorly in your first couple rides, those IPs there were like blood, sharks with blood in the water. If they smelled blood, they were coming after you. So it was it was good to do well. And fortunately, I I did well and I had some luck. I'll um, I had one mission where I was the BFM two. I think it is one of the hardest missions you ever fly. You've got an F four weapon school instructor pilot behind you 9,000 feet and you're expected not to get shot. Not many people are able to do that in three engagements. I went three engagements to this guy. And of course this was a nine J's was what they had loaded, not Lima's. They didn't, I don't think they even had Lima's out at the time, but their opponents all had a nine J type weapons. I was able to go three engagements and not get shot. And I was really proud of myself for that because not many people did it. And the other thing was, then you had a ride against an F-5. And I had three engagements against this F-5. And this, this particular F-5 guy really wasn't very good because he should have made life really rough on me, and he didn't. I won all three of those engagements. And I had, uh, unfortunately, he's deceased now, but I had um, Clyde Phillips, Joe Bob Phillips, in my back seat. And Joe Bob, between engagements, is trying to get this guy to be harder on me. And he's just not able to do it. And I'm winning all, all of these engagements. And so as we bingo out and we're joining up to go back home, Joe Bob asked me, he says, uh, what would you think of that F5 driver? I said, Joe Bob, I said, that was the best F5 driver I've ever seen in my life. He went cold white mic on me, wouldn't talk to me the rest of the flight. So, <laughs> but it was, it was good to get off to a good start there because you got a reputation with the IPs that you could handle the airplane. And that made it a lot easier on you in the whole rest of the program. Outside of that, there were a lot of times it was like drinking from a fire hose. I mean, you're going out um, three V5, three F4Es against three, uh, three F4Es against three F5Es and two F15s. And you're expected to win that. We didn't win it very much. The F15... We, we could have done fairly well, I think, three F4s against three F5s, but the two F15s 
just tilted the fight an awful lot in their favor. But it was it was a tough fight, and you were expected to do smart things and to do as well as you could do with it. You in in our last call, you talked about how you did a I don't know, it was a four v one in the F sixteen, and you you described how you uh, took out all four F fives. I think it was I think it was four, it was maybe three. It was one v three. Was one v three? Okay, so but you described that, and so I, I know that you're you know you've already and your disclaimer at the beginning said this stuff all happened a very long time ago, but I know that people are going to be curious as to what sort of thing you'd have to do in an F4 with an F5 behind you or another F4 behind you to either end up neutral or end up winning that engagement. So what, what did that consist of? A max rate defensive turn, some maneuvering in the vertical? What, what, what were you doing? Yeah, it's it starts out with a max rate turn, putting your lift vector on him and just pull him to generate angles to force his nose off. If his nose comes off, then you generally take that opportunity to unload and extend and get some of that airspeed back. And when he goes back on you, then it's another max rate turn into him. And it's generally always in a descending spiral because you're losing airspeed and you want to get down to a place and altitude where you can sustain that G and that airspeed better. Every once in a while, you can get him in close enough that you can do a nose high reversal and maybe get him even with you or even spit him in front. You can do that against another F-4 not flown by a fighter weapons school instructor pilot much easier than you can against a, a FWIC IP. He's not going to fall for that. I was never able to to, to reverse on a, a fighter weapons school air-to-air -air flight instructor IP and get him neutral or out in front. So it's mostly just hard turns and extensions, hard turns and extensions, just keeping him out of there, getting the fight down to where you can sustain a little better. Against an F-5, that's a really tough fight, even a neutral head-on fight against an F5 with an F4, because I think for sustained turn at like 15,000 feet, an F4 can sustain around five degrees a second, and an F5, he can sustain around eight. So he's got not quite, but, you know, getting close to twice your turn rate, and that's a really hard fight to win. And, and the book answer for that was you try to take him in the vertical. Because he would use his airspeed to generate that turn rate and that small turn radius. And when he did that, he lost airspeed. So then you'd take it up in the vertical where he couldn't get to and then come around behind. The problem was, as you did this and took it up in the vertical and you're coming back down, you may or may not be able to keep sight of the guy. And if you lose the sight, you're going to lose the fight. You know, you got to keep sight of the adversary if you're going to win. So F F4 against an F5 is a really tough fight to win. Um, it's just the way it was. What, what did you do if you if you lost sight? Generally, you would try to go 180 out from his last known position to just extend and leave the fight. The worst thing you could do is just keep turning because chances are he might still see you. F5 is a lot smaller than an F4. And the F4, if he wasn't in burner, he smoked, the engine smoked, so it showed where you were. So if you lost sight, you have to try to as many angles from his last known node position and position and leave. And we said that right at the beginning that I think the first time you were a uh, guest on Temp Century was when you were talking about the constant peg program and your participation in that. So you went there and flew the MiG-21 and, and MiG-23, became the high-time guy in the MiG-23. Was this then, at the weapons school, the first time you were exposed as a student to Constant Peg? Um, had Constant Peg started at that time? Uh, Constant Peg hadn't really started as a program. There was supposed to be one ride for us against MiG-21s, but that was about the time, I think it was Aviation Week, came out with a program that had a picture of a MiG-21 on the cover and something about Air Force operating MiG-21s, and they shut down that program. We didn't get to fly against the MiGs. Uh, okay. So you're so actually you flew, you went to the 4477th and flew the MiG without having actually flown against it. No, I'd flown oh, against no, it when I was in the 474th wing flying F-16s. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. But you never got to do it in the F4. Okay. Yeah, correct. So so with regards to that, then just extend that conversation a little. Um, against the MiG-21, how would you fly the F4? Similar sort of thing because similar performance to the F5, the, the MiG-21 has a similar performance to the F5? You have to try to keep away from the MiG-21. You have to try to keep a turn radius of spacing. 
Because if you got in close to that guy and he jacked the nose up to 40 degrees, it just stopped in space. You were going to go in front of it. Uh, even F-15s and 16s had problems staying behind a MiG-21 when he jacked the nose up because it would fly at 80 to 90 knots very easily. So you had to stay away from him. You had to keep your speed up to stay away from him. If he turned back into you, you'd have to go up over the top, try to keep sight of the guy. But getting in a turning fight with a MiG-21 with an F-4 would have, would have ended up poorly for the F-4. In our last call, Gabby, you told some some great stories around your time in the, well, actually, you told some stories about the MiG-23, uh, which was interesting. Did you have any similar experiences in the F-4, and any, any sorties, any flights that really stand out in your mind, bring you out in cold sweats? Cold sweats? No, I don't really think so. You know, I'd, I think probably everyone that ever flew the F-4 has departed it. But uh, but it it was fairly uh, predictable in the way it departed controlled flight, fairly predictable in the way it recovered from it. So I'll, I'll tell you one story. It was kind of funny. This was a, I was in F4 RTU, and it was a student in the front seat. And we were doing an accelerated stall, which you're 350 knots, and you just you pull on the stick. And you're still pulling about three G's where you go through 19.2 up to like 23 to 25 units and you get heavy buffet and you get wing rock. And they say you might get nose slice. I never got nose slice. And the way you recover from that is you just ease off to like 19.2 units. And this student I had, he eased all the way off to like 11 units, which is the way you recover from a different type of stall, but not an accelerated stall where you're in a fight and you just want to get back in the in the turn. And he unloaded way too much. And I said, no, no, no. I said, that's that's not how you do that. I said, let me show you. And so I took it and got it up to about 350 or 400. I'm pulling on it. I take it back. I take it up to 25. The wings are rocking. All of a sudden, this airplane does a high energy departure over the top, does two big rolls, and ends up as I unloaded, going straight downhill toward the ocean. Uh, you know, we're 15,000 feet or so, so we got room. And, you know, I'm just going, my heart's in about kind of pounding like that in the back. And this kid in the front says, I just don't think it read like that in the phase manual. <laughs> you know? I said, no, that's 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 not what it was supposed to do on that. But it was predictable. You know, you knew it departed. You knew how to recover the airplane. I only knew, I think, of one or two guys that ever actually got the plane into a spin. Um, I never spun it, but, you know, it it. I, almost everyone has departed it, but it recovers fairly quickly. That reminded me, I, I talked to Paco. Um, Paco was talking about the F-4 weapons school, which uh, he didn't go to. He ended up going to the F-15 weapons school. But uh, but he he was talking about F-4s coming back and landing and their brake chutes had all been popped already because they had got they had departed controlled flight i don't know whether or not that's the same as spinning i don't know if he was talking about them spinning but they had departed that was, uh, let's see out of stick forward ailerons or neutral if not recovered maintain full forward stick and deploy drag shoot spin is stick maintain full forward ailerons full with spin turn the aircraft and loaded ailerons neutral uh so the, the drag shoot was part of the outer cold control stick forward ailerons or neutral if not recovered maintain full forward stick and deploy drag shoot uh i never I never deployed the drag chute in flight. I never was in a flight where anybody deployed the drag chute in flight. And I personally never heard of anyone that ever done that did that, but it was part of the procedure. Was there, uh, I don't know if it's uh, apocryphal or if it's a real story, but there, there was, there is this sort of well-known story about the two F4s who duel it out until they're about to hit the ground and then the pilots both punch out and then they meet in the bar and have a drink or something. Is that is that? Do you know that story? I'm sure that's a Nellis story. Maybe Jeremiah Weed is something to do with that. Uh, it's I, you know, I, does it ring a bell to you. I don't remember both people punching. I remember both pilots punching out. A front seat or a back seat are punched out. Okay. Uh, and we won't we won't mention names. Yeah, but it was two fighter weapons school instructor pilots, and neither neither one wanted to lose. And so, and one of them departed controlled flight and he's in the process recovering it, but the ground's coming up 
the backseater, who was another fighter weapons school instructor pilot, punches him out. And, uh, yeah, then they were going up the hill and they stop at the crash site. And there's a bar nearby and they were going to do some drinking and they're talking to the bartender and he doesn't have the type of whiskey they wanted, but he had this thing, Jeremiah weed, and they were doing afterburners where they light them. And so they do a couple of those with Jeremiah weed and the bartender tries it, sets his beard on fire. And then they come back to the Nellis bar and they say, you gotta, you gotta get some of this Jeremiah weed on stock. And so I think that was the genesis of the uh, marriage between the fighter pilot and Jeremiah weed. I think it still goes on today. Yeah, I read that they've they've shut the factory. So if you've got some, keep it. Oh, no, I don't, oh my. I'm going to have to go see if there's any in stock down at my local liquor store. I've got about a half a bottle left. Yeah, keep, that's probably still going to be worth a small fortune in in five or so years or whatever. But um, yeah. So that story is true then, as far as you're concerned. It's not apocryphal. It's it's a... I wasn't, there pers- I wasn't there personally, but that's what I hear. Okay. Let's, Gabby, let's move to the AMA before I forget about it. Um, so we've got some questions from the audience. We have uh, 10% True, a Discord channel, which is a, a great place to come if you're online and you have an interest in aerospace or defense because there's lots of people there with similar interests. And one of the benefits of being there is that you can ask questions of guests like Gabby. So... Um, I don't know if we're going to have time to do all of these, but we'll do as many of them as you can. So Gorio asks, what was the favorite model of Phantom that you flew? That's a good question. Um, it's definitely between the hard wing E or the slat. Because the, the hard wing E didn't turn as well, but it maintained its energy a little better. I'd probably still have to go with the slat for a total airplane, even though I think the D model radar had some, uh, it had a little bit narrower beam width. So its contact range was a little bit better. The E model, they opened the beam width up a little bit to get more coverage, but they had reduced the max contact range a little bit. But I, th- I think the, the probably the newest one, the slatted E with the 556 five, mod and maybe the Tizio in it was, would be my favorite. Okay. He asked what your favorite mission is, but I think we know what the answer to that is. Air, um, air to air by far. Uh, and he asked what the, the hardest thing to adjust for when flying the F4C. And that's the question. I can't tell you any more on that. Was was there anything that you found difficult to adjust for, to when you were flying the C model? Actual flying the airplane wasn't significantly different than the other, and certainly not different than the D. Uh, just for you know the fact that there's no computers that you know particularly trying to hit an air air target with a manually depressible gun sight. Uh, yeah, that that would probably be, you know, on a gun pod that's strapped to the belly that you don't know if it's bore sighted correctly. That's probably the the most difficult thing. Okay, Rally Fan One Nine Nine has asked um, if you could have mapped out how the program meant how how the programs went. What would you like to have seen the F four and the F sixteen become? Hmm. Well, the F four pretty much was what it was. You know, it was a multi-role fighter. There wasn't any pure air superiority fighter at the time. So the F-4, you know, the only thing I could have thought about for that was where they would have gone earlier to the air-to-air role and trying to figure out the uh, the long-range BVR AIM-7 shot and made the missiles more reliable. Hmm. Uh, the F-15 and 16, they were they were developed... You know, the the 15 was the air superiority fighter. Congress wanted it to be able to drop bombs. Uh, The the 15 developers didn't want to do that because that added weight, which reduced performance. The 16 was initially called the lightweight fighter, and it was multi-role. But when it was being developed, as I recall, they didn't want the F-16 to have a lot of air-to-air capability at the beginning because that would conflict with the F-15 in the air superiority role. And that's why at the beginning, the F-16 had no radar missile. It only had the short range uh, AIM-9s. Of course, when they went to the AIM-9Ls and the AIM-9Ms with all aspect capability, uh, that changed a lot of that air-to-air role for the F-16. But I would have uh, liked to have seen 
uh, you know, AMRAM eventually came aboard. The AIM-7 would have been too heavy a missile for the 16 to carry and had a lot of, it certainly couldn't have carried four. It maybe could have carried two somewhere, but it doesn't have sparrow wells in it. It would have had to carry them out on the pylons. And some later on air defense units on the West Coast, I think Portland maybe had those. But uh, but getting that C model in the F-16 and getting AMRAMs on it, I think that that gives the F-16 a wonderful multi-role capability and and tremendous air-to-air capability. Just as a follow-on to that question, I was curious, uh, having been prompted by it, did you did you continue to look at the F-4 through the rest of your Air Force career, just from afar? I mean, did you look at the F-4F, the Luftwaffe, what they've done with it, putting, I think, the APG-66 in it. I can't remember which one they, they put in it. There's the Canas, which was the Israeli one. I don't know what radar they put in that. But I think, the, you know, the Greeks did, I don't know which version they did, but the Greeks have like a, a an upgraded version as well. Some of these guys have AMRAM and some pretty good VR capability. Did you did you look at those and think they would have been cool to fly? I didn't uh, at the time. It would have been cool to fly when I was in F fours, but once I went to F sixteens, then that became my focus. You know, okay. the F four guys had their thing to do, and they needed to focus on that, and, and we needed to focus on our thing. Okay, so uh, Ghost Dog had actually asked another question which was similar to mine about tricks that you might employ when flying the F-4, but I think you've answered that there pretty much wasn't much I'll, you could I'll do. Give, I'll give you one more that would work occasionally. And and one of it was built upon trying to get the other guy to lose sight. So you'd start this intercept maybe from those on and you're passing canopy to canopy, you know, a thousand feet apart or something doing 500 knots. And and one of the things I do sometimes is right when you pass, you'd start in this real hard turn. And, of course, you'd go to his 6 o'clock where you'd lose sights on. Then I'd roll at 90 degrees and explode it in the vertical, hoping that he would continue this hard turn looking for me back there when I was up here. Sometimes that worked. Sometimes it didn't. But but trying to get the other guy to lose sight was one way to, to win the thing quickly. Okay. Um so Nux has some questions, which are more about the F-16, but he's helped me out before, so I'll ask them because I'm kind that way. But he said, what was the transition like from two-seat to single-seat aircraft when you went from the F-4 to the F-16? Um, pretty uneventful, to be honest. Uh, as I've talked about before, when you've got uh, two people, there's advantages and disadvantages. Advantage is you split up the workload. And you've got four eyes instead of two. So you got one guy can be looking somewhere where you're not. Um, the 16 solved that in a couple different ways. Uh, first thing they did was the switches and everything were so good. The radar was so good. The modes were so good. It was made for a single person. So the workload wasn't all that much more than it was in a two seat airplane for the front seater. Um, visibility for six o'clock. In an F-4, I could maybe see back to 5 o'clock and 7 o'clock. In an F-16, I could turn around right and see my left wing tip. You know, the visibility was outstanding in it. So that that took a lot of that from it. Um, it also cut down on a lot of the chatter that you had coming into your ear. Because if you were in a fight in an F-4, you may well have the backseater talking to you, a wingman talking to you, this aural tone from the headset going beep, 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 beep. Uh, maybe an AIM-9 tone coming up and an AWACS talking to you. Well, for the F-16, you didn't have the backseater talking to you and you didn't have the tone in the headset. Um, so it, it limited the amount of uh, of audio oversaturation or whatever that you could get. So it was uh, the, the airplane with one person in it is three or four times as capable as an F-4 with two people in it mostly because of just the way the systems are designed and integrated. Um, would Soviet aircraft, Nux has asked an interesting question, would Soviet aircraft have benefited from two-seat crewing? I don't know. I think some of their, there's a line of their Su-27 family that's a side-by-side air-to-ground. Yeah, Su-34. Isn't there? Su-34. Yeah. And they've got Su-30s wow. as well, which are two-seaters. Is there? I, I, 
I don't know much about their two seat airplanes. But do you think um, a two seat MiG twenty one or a two seat MiG seventeen? You know, if you go back to the Cold War types, I guess they're. I mean, they're radar vectored, aren't they? They're GCI controlled. Not much autonomy within the aeroplane to for the pilot to make decisions. So, what what would you get from having another person in the cockpit? You know, one thing you lose when you put someone else in the airplane is you lose gas. They got to take a fuel a fuel tank out to put that other seat in there. Mm. So I don't, you know, MiG twenty one. The early MiG twenty ones had the high fix radar, which is range only. They have to be vectored to the stern, get the range, shoot the missile. The later on uh, MiG twenty ones had Jaybird which once again is kind of a fixed scan. And I think it looks about three degrees low to 15 degrees high. Um, hard to get radar. I was able to do one front stern reattack in the MiG-23 that had the Jaybird radar in it. Uh, but by the time you can lock, which is 20 clicks, about 12 miles, that's where the lock box is. I mean, it's really tough to get that front quarter lock and then maintain it around to the stern. So those those airplanes that are designed mostly for the the vector, GCI vector to the stern, I don't think they would have um, benefited much from having a, a backseater. Okay. Um, so Crape asked, I don't know whether or not you're going to be able to answer this, but I'll ask the question. Crape asked how the beginnings of the F-4 program compared to the F-16s very early operational performance. Um, I, I guess it's, it's sort of questioning whether the lessons learned between the you know the the A model, which I know you didn't fly, the B model, and then later variants for the Air Force and, and maybe the F-16A and the F-16C. Don't well, know. I think they they developed kind of along the same lines, which is do the best you can with what you've got when you start and then improve on it as you go along. And that has been the um, the basis for almost every airplane. If you go from the F-4, you know, we improved as we went along. The F-16 came out with the A and then went to the C. Um, and and the, the, the YF-16, the technology demonstrator, basically, you know, it, it didn't have hardly any of the capabilities the A model had. Um, but you improve as you go along. The F-15, I think, is the same way. They had the A and the C, and you do mid-updates on it. The F-22, I think, is is getting to be the same way. So all airplanes kind of develop along the same lines. You do the best you can with the technology you've got at the time. You improve them as you go along. Some of these things are real long lead times. Like I think the uh, ATF, the F-22, they started working on that thing back in, what, the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, matter of fact, I think I think I was offered a job, a staff job working ATF in the early in the mid 80s, around 83 or 84. Uh, so that thing was on a long time. Before it flew in the 90s, was it early 90s was when they did the YFs. And then the first squadrons came on board when around 2000 yeah this this time so with that you're working with 1970s technology in 2000 at least 20 year old technology and you can't keep updating it as it goes along or you'll never get it built so sometimes you just got to freeze it and build the damn thing and say then we'll update it we'll do a big update later uh so christoph has asked was adding the internal gun really necessary adding the what the internal gun. You you kind of already answered it, but oh, for the E model. Yeah. Oh yeah, great great addition, great addition. Would you rather fly an upgraded Phantom or an F sixteen into combat? F sixteen by far. Okay. Um, and you said you didn't really sort of track the later variants of the Phantom, so I won't ask his next question because he, that's relevant to sort of Super Phantom and, and upgraded versions. Yeah. Fair okay. Enough. Pooled H18 asked, did you ever fly with uh, p Wizos, pilot Wizos? No, I never did, although uh, they were mostly gone towards the end of the Vietnam War and all the, the pilot Wizos had upgraded. But we would 
quite often put two pilots in in one airplane and go to the range if we didn't have enough back seaters or something or flight surgeon wasn't available. Uh, you might just find two pilots in it or a pilot and an IP just fill in the seat. Uh, Jax, the Raptor dude, had asked a question about, I think you've already answered it though. So he's referencing the 4477th video that we did with Z-Man uh, where I think Z had said, if I'm going to a phone booth fight, I'll choose the fifth fish bed over the F4. And I think you've already explained why that is. Yeah, by far. Fish bed's going to win that fight. Um, okay. Sedlow's asking a question about AIM-7 effectiveness in Vietnam, which I think we've already covered. Uh, but he does ask, did you have faith in the AIM-7? Well, we knew the AIM-7 for what it was. So we were going to use it. We didn't We didn't want to not carry it. But we understood that the PK wasn't 100% in it. So you were going to use it and see what it did. And then if that, did, if that didn't work, you were going to go to the AIM-9s. He's also asked it whether or not your tactics changed as later variants of the AIM-7 came in. So you talked about shooting the AIM-7E2. Um, I, I not a not a that that familiar with the AIM-7s, but there was an M, there was an MH. Um, I think those are the ones that the Air Force retired the AIM-7 with. But um, what improvements came in the AIM-7 during your time as an operator, and and did they change your tactics? Uh, didn't change the tactics, just made the missile have a higher PK with the tactics we were using. Uh, the changes to the missile were basically all internal. The, the missile body itself was the same, looked the same. Um, so it was just more uh, reliability built into it. And I don't know, that might have been one of the things that took it from that PK of 0.1 up to 0.25 or something, or maybe even beyond that eventually. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, our tactics pretty much stayed the same. It's just the missile reliability using those tactics would have gone up. Okay. Uh, only a couple more, Gabby, and then we're, and then we're done. Um, so Amram, Amram Missiles, who's Scotty, who's our Chief Technology Officer, effectively, asked whether or not when the F-15 first appeared as a replacement for the F-4, what did you think of it? And did you change your mind? And or what do you think of the F-15 now? Oh, I first saw the F-15 fly in 1972 up at Edwards. Uh, we went up there for something and it was flying, had the big test boom out the front, orange on the wings and on the tail. Um, we knew then that it was going to be a technological jump from what we were doing, that it was better uh, air to air than anything we had. Uh, at the time, all F4 guys wanted an F15. When I came out of Clark, I wanted an F15. But they offered me weapon school, so I took that. And I probably would have wanted an F-15. I had to go to an F-4 unit out of that, which I went to Homestead. Coming out of there, if the F-16 hadn't come online, I would have probably wanted an F-15 from Homestead. But with the F-16 online being brand new, I wanted that one. So, but it was, uh, it, it, everyone knew it was going to be a great airplane. Everybody wanted to fly it. I don't think, uh, well, today, the guys today, probably want the F-22, but the F-15 is still uh, still has a reputation of a, a great air-to-air fighter, and all you got to do is look at its exchange ratio. I don't know what it is, but I'm not sure there's been an F-15 shot down air-to-air, and it's shot down probably 100 or more planes. Yeah, I think the number that's most often quoted is 105. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Uh, Exchequer has asked the f4 has a distinctive uh anhedral and dihedral mix between the outer wings and the horizontal st- uh, tailplane assembly uh did this feature give the f4 any particular characteristics that for example if you flew it blindfolded you'd automatically know it was a phantom i don't know i think the a model did not have as much of that as the B and the C ended up having. And I think that's part of what the A model taught them. Um, I used to know why it had so much anhydral and dehydral, but I don't know anymore. You'll have to Google it. (laughs) I I know Google will know. 
so there are some brain cells in that massive head of yours or massive brain of yours that are inaccessible because i noticed i noticed because at the end of the last conversation you i asked you to recite the checklist for the shutdown on the f1 and you did that and that resonated You're amazed mostly with people that, aren't you? i am but also i'm amazed that and i suppose i shouldn't be but i kind of am i'm amazed that you remembered that you flew 127 or whatever in one what sorties or something in one year and uh, at Clark, or I'm amazed that you can just instantly recite the spin checklist or the uh, out of control checklist, two different checklists for the F4 without even having to pause. So it's good to know that there are some things in your head that you can't get back. Um, I can't remember where I parked my car, but I can remember <laughs> that. That's what technology's for. Get a get a beeper or a GPS. Get Google got, Maps to tell you where I've you parked it. I've got it. I've got a car car finder. I just hit it when I leave the car, and that way I can find it again. Sometimes, if I'm at the airport, I take a picture of my car parked next to a sign that says like C twenty two. Two two more questions for you. Actually, one more question because the last one was going to be for Z, and he's not here. So one more, one more question, uh, which is from Pyro. Um, Pyro's an ex uh, an F one eleven guy, uh, F one eleven pilot. And uh, he's, he's also a member of our Discord community. Always interesting listening to him post. But he's asked, high lift devices, uh, which are best when they worked and which worked best in the F4? So you talked about the leading edge flaps and slats. Um, yeah. Uh, different modes. For landing, the leading edge flaps work best. Uh, just because they added the boundary layer control, which uh, which gave it nice, good handling qualities on final, very stable and everything. But the leading edge flaps were worthless in flight. They had, I think, a 230 knot blow up limit switch in them. So if you're below 230, you could put the flaps to half and get some more lift out of the thing even though I don't think half flaps gave you uh, the leading edge stuff. Or maybe it gave you flaps, but not the BLC, I forget. You have to go to full to get the leading edge with the BLC. But So maybe a little bit air to air, but not much. But it was the leading edge devices, flaps with BLC was best for landing. In the slat, the slats were best in the air to air mode, but they made the landings a little bit different, a little bit more... I won't say challenging, but not as totally simple as in a in a hard wing C D or E hard wing E. And the second part of uh, Pyro's question is: uh, How many departures did you experience firsthand? And you kind of talked about one departure, but was it common for you? Uh, not totally common. It wasn't something that you wanted to do. You wanted to max perform the airplane, and there was a different. Uh, a space between 19.2 in the hard wing and when you would start getting that hard wing rock and buff at around 23 units. Plus, when you got over 19.2, you got the lights showing you that you were getting slow and you heard the beep and going beep, 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 beep. So that was your key to start easing off on this. I probably departed the plane, you know, in 18 or 1900 hours, maybe four or five times, maybe three or four times. Something eh, four or five, I guess. Not a lot. Didn't happen often, but every once in a while, something you know, the AOA would lag or something, and it would almost always do that high energy type roll, snap roll over the top down the backside, and forward stick virtually always immediately recovered it. Hmm. And he's also asked, "What was the best you experienced or watched?" I wonder if he means who. Who was, who was the best F4 guy you watched? Or I, I, don't, I don't know what he means by that. I mean, what? Who was the best? You you mean besides <laughs> me? Okay. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of difference between if you go to your top five or ten pilots in any squadron, there's not a whole lot of difference between them. On one day, one guy's going to be better, and on another day, the other guy's going to be better. It's kind of like being the fastest gun in the West. Hmm. Sometimes you are, and sometimes you're not. You know, Clyde Phillips had a reputation for being very good and very aggressive, and he also was very devious. 
this one mission where in, in fighter weapon school, I think it was Joe Bob, me, and Case Ritzma, we got three F5s, and we're doing point defense against, uh, we got three F4Es, and we're doing point defense against three F5Bs and two F15s. And so we all taxi out in the Army area, and all eight of us are lined up. And Joe Bob's number one, and he calls down. He says, um, I got a hydraulic leak. I got to abort this. Two, you got the lead. I'll take care of calling the command post. And he goes, and he starts taxiing back. So I go, okay, I'm now the lead. So Case and I go over to channel uh, three or whatever for tower, and we're doing single ships with 10-second spacing, and I'm taking off. And as I take off, you know, Joe Bob's talking about, as I take off, reach for the gear handle, I see Joe Bob do a 180 and start taxiing back out again towards the Army area. And I'm going, that's kind of interesting. So we go out in the area and we set up at the north end of, I think it was Alamo and the F-5s and the F-15s come in at the south end. And we start getting into this engagement. And all of a sudden, there's a third F-4 that shows up. I don't think Case knew it for a while. The F-5s and the F-15s didn't know it for the whole engagement, but they were playing it on then 5v2, and there's 5v3, and there was one guy unaccounted for, and he got several shots that way. So Joe Bob was kind of devious. He wasn't predictable in a lot of things, and uh, and uh, I kind of uh, I kind of liked that. <laughs> so fi final question then. You said right at the beginning – uh, you were talking about dive toss, and you said there was a squadron that got in trouble for it. Can you tell that story quickly? You said that uh, uh, yes, the Holloman guys. Dive toss. Every six months, you're supposed to qualify in like dive bomb, low angle strafe, your nukes, and dive toss. And the dive toss did. I don't know what the criteria was. 140 feet or something to be a qualifying bomb. And you'd almost never do that. And the goal kind of of every squadron was to do 20% of your qualifications done a month. So by the time you were done five months or your six month period, you were done. You had a month left over for slop or guys that went on leave or got sick or whatever. And, and these slides and stuff were shown at the standups for the wing commander, and the DO and things like that. And they would show at the end of month one, you'd be 20% done on all your things except dive toss. Maybe you'd be 6% on that. And you'd work your way up and you'd start getting towards, um, you know, May or something, the fifth month. And and the wing commanders are saying, you you guys don't know the system. They don't know how to make it work. Look how poor they are. You need to teach your guys how to do this stuff. Get them up to speed. He wanted to qualify so his wing didn't look bad. He flew with it. The wing commander flew with it. He knew it didn't work worth a shit. But he'd do that. Eventually, we'd end up pencil whipping the squares, going manual. And qualifying with the thing, you know, tell them it was dive toss. And every six month period, the squadrons, squadron commanders would get together and say, okay, now this six months, we're not going to do that. We're going to be honest. They need to know that system doesn't work. And then every six month period was the same thing. You wouldn't do it, wouldn't do it till like the fourth or fifth month. And then one squadron would break and they'd all of a sudden show their dive toss qualification higher than the others. And the wing commander would say, this guy's guys are better than yours. He, they know how to do this. You don't. Then everybody would pencil whip it again and, and you'd go from there. I even had, I was the assistant weapons guy at Bent Water, the 91st squadron, and we were having an ORI. And I'm sit, I was the guy that logged the bomb scores and all that stuff, kept track of the statistics. And I'm sitting across the desk from a guy, just sort of like you and me. And he's asking me about this. And he's asking me about dive toss and why our dive toss numbers aren't as good as our dive bomb numbers. And I, told, I said, you know, the system's hard to use. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And this is no kidding. This is IG inspector major looks across at me. I think I'm a lieutenant. And he goes, why don't you do what everybody else does? He says, go direct. And just like that, like he's hitting the pickle button in direct. Everybody knew it was being pencil whip. Now, Holloman, I think, got caught at it in a way that somebody needed to make an example of them. And I think they got in trouble for it. Holloman got in trouble for one or two things during that time period. But they were just kind of the, the whipping people down there. Because, because they had held out? I don't know what they did, what, whether they held out or whether they just admitted to pencil whipping it or something. 
I could be wrong on that. Cause I know they got in trouble sometimes for bringing some things back from Germany that weren't declared customs wise. And I think they got in trouble for that. A few people there got in trouble, not everybody. Hmm. And I, I seem to remember dive toss. There was an issue with that there, but it could have been, could have been any, any squadron, any wing in the air force. I mean, we all had the same problem. So, so when and when they introduced the target pod, then that um, remedied it. If you could get the distance off of the laser spot, uh, the the laser, it did. But there weren't very many units had that. I mean, the only place I ever flew with the paved spike pod was at weapons school. Well, Gabby, um, it's been another two hours of fantastic entertainment from you. Thank you so much for allowing me to coax you back onto the channel for the fourth time. I think. Do you find anything else? Is there anything else you need to be coming back on the channel to talk about? You're going to say no, I, aren't you? I just, I just hope your viewers don't look at this and go, oh, no, not that guy again. I think when they see you and your cheery face, they'll be delighted to know there are more anecdotes and more insight coming their way. But thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And, um, yeah, and for going through the AMA and giving us another two hours of your time. It's great. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I enjoyed it. Thanks for tuning in to 10% True. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to subscribe, and if you're on YouTube, hit the bell button to make sure you get notified of the next episode. Thanks, and take care.